from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. K-State's Walt Fick will be with us to discuss pasture conditions and the grazing outlook for Kansas this summer and considerations on stocking rates in accordance with those conditions. He'll also talk about monitoring grass productivity during the grazing season. Then K-State's Sandy Johnson will take a look at cow and heifer synchronization management heading into the spring breeding season. To achieve early breeding success and high conception rates, she shared that input as part of the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd on several landscape insects that are turning up and what, if anything, to do about them. All that here on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Good to have you tuned in once again for this Agriculture Today. Another grazing season is about to open up in full around and about Kansas. You cattle producers putting animals on grass are making those final preparations. Some may have already turned out at this point. But we want to talk of the grazing prospects as our guest sees them and some thoughts as well associated with that on stocking rates. Walt Fick is on the line with us. Walt, as you know, is a range and pasture management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Well, Walt, as you look at the pasture prospects going into this uh, late spring and summer, we can say one thing for sure. It's probably not as wet out there as it was this past year, broadly speaking. I think that's that's true. Uh, Right now, I think, you know, most of the state, uh, 75 or 6 percent of it it, is pretty much uh, not in any drought situation, at least. And uh, again, we probably haven't had the the early spring, as much early spring moisture as we did a a year ago. I'd say it's probably pretty much normal. Uh, The exceptions to that might be the north central part of the state is, is starting to experience you know, some abnormally dry conditions, they call it. And then the extreme southwest corner, uh, it, it starts there. And as you get closer and closer to that Colorado border, it actually gets up into what's even considered severe drought. So those two areas of the state are a little drier than normal. But the predictions I've seen would say that other than the southwest corner of the state, that's the only part of the state where they expect uh, drought to persist, you know, very long into the season. So contingencies for those areas, Walt, that are on the dry side, in as far as stocking rates, as we move into that, it would make good sense for producers to maybe think about scaling back on those. What's your thinking there? Well, that's that's one possibility. You know, again, if if you expected the drought to persist, it may may indeed involve uh, reducing stocking rates, or a lot of times what we tell people is simply to Go ahead and stock normally, and then you'll have the flexibility to adjust if it if the drought continues. That's easier to do if you're running stockers, of course, because they can be taken off just about any time and sold during the course of the summer. A cow calf herd, you know, that's a little more difficult to deal with. So then, in those cases, yeah, you might want to back off a little bit. But we can handle it either way. You can wait and destock if necessary. Mm-hmm. But in those areas where soil moisture is ample, maybe a little, as you said, in southeast Kansas on the excessive side, producers can, for the most part, move full speed ahead with their normal stocking rates, you think? Well, that's what I would, would recommend. I, I think, you know, from year to year, you know, it, it depends a lot because how much moisture we get will have some effect or major effect on, on the forage production, but it's hard to always predict that. And so just whatever, maybe a long-term stocking rate, has been is, is that's where I tell people to start. And, you know, on a, on a really good year, you know, well, you may, it looks like you got forage left over, but on a year that maybe it's a little less than normal, you know, you might 
appear to be overgrazing a little bit, but in the long run, that normal stocking rate will, will work out quite well. What would we consider normal stocking rates as we move from west to east in Kansas, from the short grass prairie to the mixed grasses and then to the tall grass in the east? Okay, yes. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you examples and maybe what typical stocking rates would be for like cow-calf pairs. Again, in that high plains, you know, the short grass region out there where, where production's, you know, maybe only that 2,000, 2,500 pound range, you know, you're, you're talking about generally 12 to 15 acres for a cow-calf pair for the summer under normal conditions. You know, in the central part of the state where production's more likely to be, let's say, 3,000 pounds per acre, well, then we're talking maybe 9 to 10 acres for that cow-calf pair. Flint Hills and East, you know, seven to eight acres for a cow-calf pair. And all these are for, you know, full season of grazing, like probably almost up to 180 days. And for our stalkers then, it's a little different. Yeah, so, you know, again, I'll just give you that range. You know, out, out west, you know, we're probably talking, oh, seven to eight acres for, and usually the season is short, let's say for 150 days. Central part of the state, maybe four and a half to five. Here in the Flint Hills, you know, four acres for 150 days would be pretty standard for a stalkers being, you know, maybe they start at 550 pounds and hopefully they're gaining 250 pounds during the course of the summer. Now, those who engage in an intensive early stocking of, of those stalker calves, obviously, as the concept would imply, a different stocking rate for a shorter duration. Yes, you know, if, if the rate is four acres for a here in the, in the Flint Hills for 150 days for that 550 pound steer going on grass, double stocking would be two acres per steer. And that's usually then for 75 to 90 days, depending on whether you're in the northern Flint Hills or the southern, you know, longer period of time in the southern Flint Hills. And if one is so inclined, again, back to your analysis of our conditions going in, uh, we're fairly well set up to allow the IES program to succeed. I, well, I would think so quite well. This this year, growth should be good. I think we're starting to get some warmer temperatures, and that grass will be growing real well. And these stockers really gain well, the, particularly the first two months of the summer, which fits in very well with that intensive early stocking program. There is value, you think, for many a producer to look at monitoring the status of their grass throughout the growing season. There are varying ways of doing that, but you might just cover that prospect here. Well, I think the most practical way is just to have what I call an exclosure cage. You know, you can put up that prevents the animals from grazing a key, let's say, ecological site in the pasture, and then one can go out there and at a given point in time and actually clip it. You know, you can wait till the end of the season and you can see what the total seasonal production had been. But if if you're curious about whether production is anywhere close to normal or not, you know, there's there's a couple of uh, dates I think I would think about. One of those might be oh, about mid-June because about 50% of our forage production should have occurred by, you know, the 15th of June. So one could go out and clip at that time and, you know, you need to have an idea what your forage production would be for the year. But, you know, if site will produce 4,000 pounds and you go out there and clip and there's 2,000, well, that'd be right on track, you know, probably for what the year is going to be. The other key date or is a little bit later, you know, July 15th. By that time, 75% of our production has occurred. So those give us indications, you know, at those points in time, you know, how the forage is, is developing. What it doesn't really account for, though, is, you know, cattle and oh, most livestock are, are patch grazers. So we get regrowth on those areas. And, and so that's not going to be accounted for, you know, within that cage. We've talked of this before when cattle tend to concentrate on specific areas over and over again. That can uh, can skew your, your overall grazing situation there. So things that producers can do to coerce cattle to not focus on that one spot or two spots over and over again? Well, you, yeah, there's there's ways we can try to spread what we call our grazing distribution around, but it's it's going to be hard to prevent it because, you know, they, they start their grazing pattern for some reason, 
they keep going back and they eat the regrowth because it's higher quality than something that they've allowed to, to mature. But, you know, putting the salt box away from the water, for instance, you know, uh, cattle tend to graze uh, into the wind in the summertime. So the southern part of a pasture is more apt to be grazed, let's say, than the northern part. If, uh, you know, putting in the salt box, for instance, then in areas where they're less likely to go, you know, that can help distribute that grazing. And where your water sources are at in a pasture also are, can be critical to the grazing distribution. But sometimes, you know, that's you're, you're kind of limited just depending where it's at. Mm-hmm. But back to the monitoring procedure, if a producer, Walt, isn't familiar with how to interpret their clippings, to put it that way, are there guidelines or basic informational uh, resources that they can turn to? Well, yes. The NRCS, you know, their range specialists have guides uh, based on the ecological sites and what they'll produce. Mm-hmm. And then they also, within that, have these percentage production by months. And those vary a little bit across the state from east to west. But as I said, in general, that 50% of the production by mid-June, 75% by the middle of July will work pretty well anywhere in the state. Uh, but the total production can be different. You know, if, if I'm in the high plains out in western Kansas, you know, normal production might only be 2,000 pounds per acre mm-hmm. for the whole year. You know, here in the Flint Hills and east, you know, we're going to produce four to 5,000 pounds on a normal year. And central Kansas would be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. But by and large, as you look ahead, we're shaping up to have a quite productive grazing season, barring any unforeseen extended widespread droughts or the like. That's your sense of it anyway. That'd be my uh, conclusion at this point in time. They, like I say, other than that southwest corner of the state, that's the only area I've seen where they expect uh, drought to persist you know, very far into the season. And Walt, we appreciate this input very timely. We'll talk again soon, and many thanks to you. Thank you, Eric. That's Walt Fick. He's a range and pasture management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back with more on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Keeping your distance from others is important in slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are some fun things to do alone. Read a book. Take a walk. Unpack your suitcase from that trip you took last September. Paint a self-portrait. Catch up on a TV series. Do a puzzle. Remember, we should all stay home to lower the risk for everyone. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. We're back now on Agriculture Today. As cow herd reproduction management goes, we're nearing perhaps the most impactful part of the production cycle, breeding time, for spring calving herds, that is. High conception rates would be every producer's goal, and along with that, settling those females in as condensed amount of time as possible. One of the management protocols for getting that done is heat synchronization. That's a subject that K-State beef reproduction specialist Sandy Johnson is well-versed in, and she passes along some input for you producers on that as part of the conversation from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. Sandy joins cow-calf specialist Bob Weber and veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White for this exchange of thoughts on synchronization management. We've got a couple things that we're going to talk about getting the cows bred early, and often synchronization programs are one of the tools that that we want to use to do that. And I, and I wanted to ask you guys a couple questions, Sandy and Sandy and Bob. I may start with you. Do you use different programs for cows versus heifers, or are they all the same type of program? Well, we have a number of selections available for both the cows and heifers. I think heifers we have a greater opportunity to use some of the longer term protocols because uh, one, we probably have some non-cycling heifers and those longer term protocols are beneficial to those heifers that have not yet started cycling. When we go into the cow system, we have to think about days postpartum. And so if we put a longer term protocol in there, 
some of those cows may not be quite ready to respond to that additional progestin that we're using in that longer term protocol. And so we certainly see more short term protocols used with cows and heifers, I think partly because of that. We don't really have a, a long term protocol currently recommended for cows. And that's because of, you know, those cows are changing quickly postpartum as they start to cycle. And so we want to try and get most of them to respond that we can. So in most cases, we're going to suggest a protocol that includes a progestin. It helps control the cycle better as well as induce those non-cycling cows to cycle. And that's a little bit different because those heifers are pre-pubertal and we're getting them to start cycling the first time, whereas the cows are resuming cycling. Is that part of it, Bob? Yeah, that's, that's definitely part of it. Um, heifers are, are probably easier to implement a synchronization protocol in because, well, they're not, they don't have a calf on them. Um, a lot of times they're in, a, you know, managed as a group separately from the rest of the cows, and they're just easier to work through a squeeze shoot and do some of these protocols. Cows, because of the timing when the breeding season is, are often out on, on pasture and they have a calf at side. And so it becomes more of a challenge to implement a synchronization protocol. And so ease becomes really important the number of times through the shoot and those types of considerations are really probably more important for cows than for heifers in many people's hands but the good thing is we have several good protocols that have that really stood the test of time that are helpful and as uh, sandy said it has to do with um, if you give a cow or a heifer some progesterone in if she hasn't quite started cycling yet it will help her cycle a little bit earlier and that's one of the tools we can use to try to get some of these cows that aren't quite ready to start um, breeding at the start of the breeding season to maybe get them into that category. And both of you have said use a protocol with some progestin. So that would be something like a cedar or MGA. Uh, there's, there's different methods of administration of that progestin, but you want that to be a part of your protocol. It's not necessarily the whole protocol, though. You'd, you'd have some other things that you would do. So typically, and, and I know there's a big range, but Let's think on the on the heifer side. If I want to synchronize my heifers, how far in advance of the breeding season do I need to think about that? And I'm in broad terms. Am I am I going to be starting two weeks before, or four weeks before, or eight weeks before? Now, well, Sandy talked about these longer term protocols, and so for heifers, a lot of times you're talking about thirty days ahead of the breeding season when you would start um, the protocol, approximately. And for cows, a lot of times we're talking ten days. So that's kind of the difference between those short protocols and those longer protocols. And there's lots of different protocols out there. And, and one of the things that I think we'd recommend is be sure that you understand the protocol that you're using and it fits your environment. And this is a great opportunity to work with your local extension specialist or your veterinarian and figure out which protocol makes sense for your herd, which leads us to, to one of the questions that, that we've had. And we talk, talk a little bit about synchronization protocols, but also often that's tied to synchronization and artificial insemination, right? So we're giving them a round of artificial insemination. But what if I don't want to do AI, but I want to get my cows kind of more tightly together? And Sandy, I'll, I'll start with you. Can I, can I use a synchronization program and then use natural service? Yes, you certainly can. And I, when I talk to producers about this um, in terms of, well, what protocol shall I use? You know, you, you really want to be thinking about synchronization light because our goal is not to have necessarily every cow ovulating within a few hour time period. We want to group them up a little bit so we can do that a couple ways. And one of the easiest ways for producers to, uh, to do that with natural service is to go ahead and turn the bull out for five days, uh, then administer uh, an injection of prostaglandin product, and that will tighten up those cows. Now, anybody that's not cycling is not going to respond to that prostaglandin injection, but you will get a number of animals that come in heat after that prostaglandin injection that will serve to group those up. And I think if you look at some of the, the data herds that have used that, you know, they can get 80% uh, pregnancy rate in 80, 82 in a 35 day type period, depending on exactly what they're doing. So, you know, we can move those cows up just with that single injection of prostaglandin. 
If we're anticipating that we have a number of cows that are still anestrous, then we might be looking at it incorporating a progestin like a cedar with that to help induce those cows to cycle. And one of the key things that you just said, Sandy, and I just want to repeat, especially if you're using the, the prostaglandin type program, the cows have to be cycling. And with any of these sync programs, they're going to work best when the cows are cycling. And there are some, you guys, have, both you and Bob have mentioned the progestin, which may help move them up a little. But if they're cycling, these programs work well. If they're not cycling, a sync program is not going to fix your, your problem. So if you're trying to get the cows bred early, if the cows are not ready to breed in cycling, uh, that's one of, the, one of the challenges there. If I use a sync program on the cows and I'm going to put a bull with them, does it change my bull power? And Weber, I may ask you from, from the aspect of a person that sells bulls, does that change your bull power requirements? It, it depends a little bit on the on the synchronization protocol. So actually, the the one shot prostaglandin mechanism that uh, that Sandy referenced, um, I think is is a great one for producers to use. Um, it's really low cost. Um, it's pretty effective for you know, getting cows grouped up. One of the the really I think great benefits of it, though, it doesn't synchronize the cows so tightly that you overwhelm uh, your bull power. So in one of those scenarios with a, a one shot uh, a prostaglandin, I wouldn't you know, go to a one to 30 or one to 40 bull to cow ratio, but certainly you know, a one to 20, one to 25 should be sufficient, uh, particularly if you're using mature bulls. Mature um, bulls, yearly key, key, yeah, point key, key thing. Um, serving capacity on them is a, a lot more. You can wear a, a yearling bull out uh, relatively quickly. So if you are using some yearling bulls, you know, the, the rule of thumb of uh, one one cow per month of age at turnout and shortened. Obviously, in this um, synchronization, you're going to have a shorter season anyway, but uh, you know, make sure you're, you're adequately stocked there. You know, if you're going to uh, natural service uh, cover cows that have been synchronized with a, a progestin, uh, so a cedar protocol um, where the synchrony is expected to be much tighter, ramping up uh, bull power is certainly recommended. Uh, and even more emphasis on the importance of breeding soundness exams and making sure all the bulls you're turning out are as good a potential breeders as you can make them. So even if I do an AI program, if I sink the cows tightly and do an AI program, the cows that don't get bred by AI are still going to be pretty synchronized the next cycle. That's what you're saying. So I got to be sure my bulls are ready to go. Yeah, and in in that protocol though, if you're if you're AIing, and we'll use let's assume it's a fixed time AI, and we have modest success, so half the cows are are bred. The remaining group is now half of the inventory. They're still going to be spread out some because of you know, sort of the natural difference in estrus length. Plus, um, there were some anestrus cows probably at the beginning that didn't respond, and so you'll kind of get them spread out and and. With an AI program, I don't recommend really reducing your bull capacity a lot anyway, even though we got a bunch of them bred because of that next round of, of cows cycling. So I don't think you have to go crazy overstocking bulls, but certainly don't get rid of most of them either. Joining K-State's Bob Weber, Bob Larson, and Brad White on the latest BCI Cattle Chat podcast, K-State Beef Reproduction Specialist Sandy Johnson they also talked in more detail about getting the cow herd to settle early on that podcast. You can hear all of that in full at beefcattleinstitute.org. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Now in our 96th year of broadcast service to agriculture in Kansas and the Central Plains, this is the K-State Radio Network and agriculture today. Eric Atkinson here as we move on now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
The new Navigable Waters Protection Act still leaves farmers and ranchers exposed to regulation of private property. That's the allegation in an amended lawsuit filed in federal court on Monday. The original lawsuit filed by the New Mexico Cattlemen's Association also targets the 1986 regulation alleging both versions illegally regulate non-navigable ponds, wetlands, and tributaries. The group originally filed a lawsuit in November of last year challenging the 1986 regulation. The challenge came after the EPA finalized a repeal of the 2015 rule because the repeal reverted back to the 1986 rule until the most recent rewrite was completed, that new final rule published in the Federal Register on April the 21st. Now, this lawsuit is asking the court to declare several provisions of the Clean Water Act, the 1986 regulations, and or the Navigable Waters Protection Rule are statutory and constitutionally invalid and to enjoin their enforcement, as the suit reads. The lawsuit said the new rule would require farmers and ranchers in New Mexico to seek federal permits at significant cost to use their property for its intended purpose, as it reads. In addition, the lawsuit says that farmers and ranchers could be required to seek Clean Water Act determinations. The group said in its lawsuit that both the 1986 and 2020 definitions contain, quoting again here, an overbroad and illegal definition of the navigable waters. Meantime, a number of environmental groups have said they intend to file lawsuits against the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. Their lawsuits claim that the federal agencies violated the Administrative Procedure Act in promulgating the repeal rule and merely reverting it back to the 86 rule instead of reintroducing it for public comment. Raising the Commodity Credit Corporation borrowing authority to $68 billion from its current $30 billion each fiscal year is supported by House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson, but he wants conditions on any such increase. The American Farm Bureau Federation has advocated boosting CCC authority to that $68 billion. That's a level which reflects what the level should be if it were adjusted for inflation. Among conditions he wants, Peterson told reporters he wants any CCC spending to be signed off by the leaders of the House and Senate Agricultural Committees. He said the CCC and the appropriators have become the farm bill, as he put it. They are doing farm policy, and they are not experts on farm policy. Policy. Peterson's words, it should not be that way. And legislation to provide funding to build out additional ethanol infrastructure has been offered in the House of Representatives. The Clean Fuels Deployment Act of 2020, as it's titled, was introduced by Representative Abby Finkernauer of Iowa and would authorize funding for installing and converting fuel pump infrastructure to deliver higher blends of ethanol and biodiesel. The measure would also authorize funding to help build and retrofit traditional and pipeline terminals, including rail lines, to blend biodiesel and to build and retrofit pipelines to carry ethanol and biodiesel. The measure would require the underwriter's laboratory certify the equipment involved as being able to distribute blends with an ethanol content of 25% or greater. This bill authorizes $100 million annually and would be authorized under the fiscal year 2021 through 2026 for this effort. And our congratulations to Kansas State University plant pathologist Barbara Vallant. She has now earned membership in the prestigious National Academy of Sciences, becoming the first scientist at K-State to earn the honor for original research conducted while at the university. The National Academy of Sciences considered the country's leading authority on matters related to science and technology. In her last decade, Barbara's work has focused on wheat blast, that dangerous new disease in which the fungus is capable of taking out entire wheat fields. She has led a research team that's driving the world's most comprehensive studies on wheat blast to keep it out of the U.S. So, again, congratulations to K-State's Barbara Vallant for being chosen for membership to the National Academy of Sciences. That takes us up to this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. With that, Greg Akagi. Greg? Brianna Jacobus, Communications and Marketing Specialist with Kansas Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom, joins us. And Brianna, with families spending much more time at home, 
How does KFAC help with their virtual resources about agriculture? So we have two main ways that we're providing resources right now. We have a virtual resources page on our website at ksagclassroom.org where um, you can look at K through 12 and then or K through 5 and then 6 through 12. And there's plenty of resources for parents to use on their own, for teachers to assign to kids and all sorts of fun educational games as well. And then we have our Facebook page where we're posting videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for kids to watch on their own and do some fun activities. So for those parents and teachers, it sounds like you continue to put new information uh, on there through your website and social media? Yes. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on our Facebook page, we're posting um, videos from the kitchen, videos from the farm, um, and all sorts of fun resources for kids to learn about ag. You have also launched your Kansas Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year applications, too. Yes, our Teacher of the Year applications have opened up, and those are due June 30th. And we've kind of mixed things up this year, and you can actually nominate your teacher on our website as well, and then we can get them that application to fill out. So if you have an amazing teacher right now, definitely go to our website and nominate them. And I know the schedule is still so much up in the air. What is the status of uh, your upcoming summer conference, which was scheduled to be in July? Yes, so we have decided to postpone that until next year, just with everything up in the air right now. It's just too uncertain. Absolutely. So once again, Brianna, if there are parents and teachers out there who want to learn more about agriculture and they can go through Kansas Foundation for Agriculture in the classroom, what is the best way for them to do that? Just go to your website or through social media? Yes, you can go to our website at ksagclassroom.org or visit our Facebook page at Kansas Foundation for Ag in the Classroom. And you can find a lot of great stuff and a lot of new information that will be updated throughout the next several weeks. Brianna, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is Brianna Jacobus, Communications and Marketing Specialist with Kansas Foundation for Agriculture in the Classroom. She joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, our regular Thursday feature on the horticultural scene. And along with us via internet now is Raymond Cloyd. Raymond is a horticultural entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. So that means we will talk bug activity in lawn and garden. And Raymond, we would expect with the recent warmer and spring-like weather that we would see a wave of insects bursting upon the scene in, in our landscapes, in our gardens. Is that the case? Yes, it is, Eric. I mean, for example, the eastern tent caterpillar uh, nests are out. Uh, If you go driving around and look around, you see these nests in the crotch of a plum or apple or other type of tree in the rosaceae family or even willow. Those are the, the nests of the eastern tent caterpillar. It's one of our earliest caterpillar defoliators. Uh, they reside in the nest. They come out during the day and feed on the young leaves. And so they actually can negatively impact trees and shrubs because if they keep denuding it of leaves, the plants can't manufacture food. So it's really critical to deal with that. Spraying the nest with an insecticide won't do you any good because they're protected. So by either disrupting the nest and allowing birds to eat them, destroying it with uh, forced water spray, whatever, but uh, at this point, it doesn't really warrant spraying them unless they're crawling on the, the trees or shrubs where they're going to be exposed to some type of spray application. Again, that's how to deal with the eastern tent caterpillar. Raymond, you tell us that there are reports of scale on landscape pine trees. What's the story there? Yeah, there's a pine tortoise scale. It's a scale that primarily is a problem on Christmas trees like Scots and Austrian pines. And uh, pretty soon the eggs will hatch and they'll see these uh, 
uh, red nymphs or crawlers uh, starting to move around. So uh, anybody doing Christmas trees or, or has these types of pines needs to be out there when the nymphs are active and spray because that's the vulnerable life stage. If you miss that, then you'll start seeing your trees covered with black city mold. And at that point, it's too late. So uh, if people want to start looking for these red crawlers or nymphs, uh, Eric, uh, now would be the time to do that. And when you see them, you can use some type of insecticidal spray. You can even use a forceful water spray to, to dislodge them. Uh, that'll also be effective. If one does not act, will that allow that scale to inflict some permanent damage to the pine then? Yes, if you miss the opportunity, and this happens sometimes when people are not scouting routinely, is they'll start notice the, you know, ants that'll feed on the honeydew. These are soft scales, so they exude the honeydew, which is a sticky, clear liquid. And of course, honeydew is a great growing medium substrate for black city mold. So when by the time you see the black city mold later on in the season, it's it's too late at that point. So you know, with scale, it's always the weak link in the chain are those young crawlers and nymphs that are moving around. You can shake some branches over a black piece of paper on a clipboard, and you'll really be able to see them very easily. So check your pines for presence of that scale. Act accordingly. Well, folks are seeing, you say, praying mantis now active out there as well. This is a fairly harmless insect, isn't it? (laughs) Well, it depends how you look at it. We have two uh, praying mantis types, the Carolina and the Chinese, and you'll see the different cases. In fact, last week's uh, newsletter had an article that I wrote on this, if you'd like to get more information. But that's always the question, Eric, is are praying mantises good or bad? And the bottom line is they eat anything they can get their, we call raptorial legs. They'll, They'll grab hummingbirds, they'll grab moths, butterflies. Little kids, just kidding, but, you know, crickets. But they eat anything they get a hold of, uh, even bees. Some of them will, we call it hawking. They'll get by a hive or whatever, and they'll snag the bees, or bumblebees uh, also be another one. But they eat anything, so we call them generalist predators. But they're also good to have in the garden because it's part of the ecosystem. But you'll be able to see these egg cases, and the Carolina and the Chinese man had different egg cases. And if you, as opposed to me describing them verbally, you can get on the website and access the newsletter, and I have pictures of what both of those look like. So it's your point of view on whether they're a beneficial or a detrimental insect, but By and large, it sounds like, Raymond, one need not take any control measures, per se, against praying mantis. No, I would not spray any insecticides for praying mantises, Eric, no. Just let them be. Lilac ash borer, and you brought that pest up in an earlier conversation. It's still out there and getting with it? Yeah. Now, lilac ash borer is one of our caterpillar borers, and uh, the adults will be out. They'll they'll mate. The females will then lay eggs on the bark of a lilac or ash tree those eggs will hatch the larva will tunnel in and once they're inside the tree there there really isn't much you can do especially for caterpillar borer so if you have a history of lilac or ash borers and you can use pheromone traps for these you might want to spray with some type of insecticide and one example is permethrin permethrin is a pyrethroid that is uh, very active on caterpillar borers and does have some good residual activity you spray from the base to about six feet up, and when the, the eggs are laid and then the larvae try to tunnel into the tree, they run into that barrier and are consequently killed. If you miss that opportunity, then you'll have to wait till the adults come out later on in the season. And, of course, you know, most of these wood-boring insects will attack stress or unhealthy trees. And so keeping your trees healthy through proper watering, fertility, mulching, and pruning – will go a long way in alleviating problems with such wood-boring insects as a lilac ash borer. We'll leave folks with this, Raymond. You've new extension insect management resources available to homeowners and gardeners that you want folks to know about. Yeah, two things. We do have our newsletter. Our extension entomology newsletter has been coming out. We've got about, I think, three issues right now. Timely information, some of the topics Uh, you and I have discussed, Eric, but also we have uh, some extension publications and two new ones. One of them is on Japanese beetle, just came out, and the other one came out early on this year called Insect and Mite Pest to Vegetable Gardens, and there's some really good images there that, you know, as we get into the season, and I think people are going to do more vegetable gardening, it'd really be a good 
publication to download. And you can download it from the Kansas State University Extension Bookstore. And we're working on working on more as we go, Eric. So we should have some more coming on this year. Great informational opportunities there. And as Raymond says, ksre.ksu.edu slash bookstore is where you can access all of that, as well as the Extension Entomology Newsletter at entomology.ksu.edu. Raymond, thanks as always. In a few weeks, we'll talk again about what's happening insect-wise in Lawn and Garden. Eric, always look forward to it, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully talk in May sometime. Indeed. Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, featured on this week's Horticulture segment. And that's our time for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Music